Okay guys, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing today. I'm not sure if you guys saw the picture. I'm going to take it out actually and see if Billy can zoom in a little bit on this picture. You good? You got it? Yeah. Okay, zoom back out. That is not what we're making today, okay? Uh, doing a little research, we were looking back as Tuna Nisoise and uh, this was a request from Mr. Guillaume Danoiselle, who is a very amazing young chef that worked with me uh, at Islington Golf Club for a while. And uh, obviously with a name like Guy Danoiselle, he's quite French and had quite the accent to go along with it too. And Guy requested for me to do uh, a Nisoise. So like a lot of other dishes, I've taken a classic preparation of a Nisoise, which was the dish that you saw there. So originally it was just tomatoes, uh, anchovies or tuna, uh, good olive oil, and uh, all the additions that happened over the years. So the addition of potatoes, the addition of French beans, some egg, sorry, an egg was in the original dish. And that was all it was, and drizzled with olive oil, very much a peasant dish, uh, known as a dish for poor people. And they used what was readily available. Tuna, obviously being in, in uh, the coast, would be availability of fresh tuna or canned tuna, uh, probably primarily canned tuna or a, a processed tuna, something that they had in the earlier times, not canned, but obviously processed. Uh, and it was something that they used and used to create a meal out of. Today we're gonna to be doing a main course meal. Uh, so it's gonna be a fairly substantial salad with a lot of new contemporary twists on a classic dish, okay? Uh, so when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about tuna itself, uh, what to look for. Very rarely will you receive uh, tuna in the whole form. I've never received a tuna in a whole form, to be honest with you. One, because of the price it would cost to get a tuna to me in whole form. And generally, uh, where it comes from, it's butchered uh, in a place that uh, it comes from originally. So whether it be uh, in Asia, tuna being a very uh, uh, important part of sushi, and, and uh, Asian cuisine, it, it uh, is caught a lot on that coast. And actually there are auctions that are done that people actually uh, sit in an auction room and, and they auction off tuna. And people leave North America, go over and pick prize tuna from Asia. Uh, most expensive tuna in the world, we looked up, one fish went for $1,800,000, one fish. So I broke it down, it was 610 pounds it worked out to be almost $3,000 a pound. So that's a pretty expensive piece of fish, right? Thank goodness this was not $3,000 a pound. Uh, this right now, I bought three pounds of tuna, roughly about $28, $29 a pound. So it was about $80, almost $88 I believe was the total cost uh, to get three pieces, uh, three pounds, almost three pounds of tuna. Okay. We won't be using that much today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the processing of the tuna. So when you're looking for the fish, uh, ideally you want the fish to be entirely fresh, good color, uh, fresh smell. So yes, it will tell, smell like fish, but it'll be a sweeter smell, not a strong odor. Uh, you don't want any unnatural slime. And what I mean by that is a fish, when it's fresh, you'll always get a little bit of slime on the exterior of the flesh, but you don't want a lot of slime. And like I said, the odor should be pleasant. Okay. It shouldn't be unappealing. Uh, I took the opportunity to butcher this piece of tuna and I left this one whole so that you could see the way it was shipped to me, okay? So it did come with a bag of ice on it to keep it cool the whole entire time. The skin is on the one part of the flesh. It has the tail or the belly piece of the, the tuna, which is usually called toro when it's the fatty, fatty part of the tuna. And then uh, this darker piece on the opposite side of the tuna is called the bloodline. Okay, so when you're butchering this piece of tuna, and I'm just gonna do a little bit of that butchery for you now. Uh, what I tend to do is cut down this part of the loin. There's a lot of belly meat here, but you'll see a lot of fibers. So typically, if you've ever gone for sushi before, what they do is they'll use a spoon and scrape the individual fibers here, and it'll release some of the meat. And that's what's done when you see uh, your spicy salmon rolls, your spicy tuna rolls, that's what they'll use for that. They'll mix that with a mayonnaise base with some sriracha or some chili paste, uh, maybe some um, tempura flakes, and they'll make a crunch roll or, or uh, put it in the interior of a roll and be able to use their straps so nothing goes to waste, okay? So 
I'm going to make sure I have a very thin and very sharp, and I did sharpen it ahead of time, very sharp uh, slicing knife. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that bloodline. Uh, it's, there's nothing wrong with eating it. It's just very strong and it can tend to be very oily. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to as close as possible to the flesh. So I'm not removing a lot of that really good meat. I'm going to re remove a lot of that dark exterior meat there. Okay. So I'm just going to take that off and that I would discard. Okay. There's also a little piece on the bottom here that I might want to turn my knife a little bit and get rid of that way. And that I discard, okay? What I'm going to do from this side of the tuna, I'm going to go right about here. I'm going to start to see where the loin changes. I'm going to cut down this way, cut across, and that will remove that part. And that's generally the part that I mentioned that I would use for any fresh rolls or tuna tartare. And then I'm going to remove this from the base here, okay? I'm going to remove the skin. And that will leave me with a beautiful loin that I can use for portioning, okay? We talked today, so I'm just going to put this away. Again, I'm going to show you with a spoon here. So what we would typically do with the spoon is just scrape it this way, and that will release some of that good meat. And then you'll get in between the next fiber, and you'll do the exact same thing, okay? So I'm just going to scrape. See all that, that nerve point there? That makes it very difficult. It's very tough. So all that that I'm removing there is just meat. Okay, and I'll just scrape that away. Okay, and that'll, that's how you do your fresh rolls, uh, your spicy fresh rolls. Okay, so none of that would be wasted. So with this piece here, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be searing this, so I want it to be fairly uniform on one side so it has a nice flat edge so I get a good sear. We're going to be blackening it today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a nice straight line down the middle here so I'll have two nice loins pieces of the loin, okay? I'm probably going to use this one here. I'm just going to trim it up on the edge here. Put this aside. And this will probably be the piece I'll be using today, okay? There we go. So that's the loin that I'm going to be using today. It's fairly, I, I said three to four ounces. Uh, that would be a great portion for a salad. Okay, and, and it's good to go. So I'm just going to put this aside in the fridge until we're ready to sear it, okay? So that'll just go back inside. There's a lot going on in this fridge today. Okay, so that's good. I'm just going to eliminate my gloves here. I'm going to quickly clean my knife and then we'll come back and we'll start uh, talking a little bit about the salad itself. In terms of the uh, Nisswa salad, we talked a little bit about classic ingredients. Uh, I did talk in the recipe about using a variety of potatoes. We'll talk a little bit about the potatoes we're using. Uh, generally for a uh, potato salad, what you want to do, there's two varieties of potatoes. You can break it down into mealy or waxy. So mealy would generally be a very high starch contact potato. Uh, content potato like a PEI or an Idaho and generally you use those for baking. Uh, high starch content means uh, that when you're baking them they fluff up, they're very light uh, but they do tend to, uh, they don't hold together very well so they don't hold their shape. Whereas a waxy potato has lower starch con uh, content but when you cut into it it has a smooth side after you've cooked them. Uh, and it holds its shape very well. So we're using a waxy potato variety, okay? A number of them. So I have some Peruvians, uh, purple Peruvian potatoes, great for color. I have some Klondike Rose, which are yellow on the exterior, red skin potato. I have some fingerlings. Generally, these types of potatoes are creamier as well, okay? So I did go ahead and blanch those in advance. So we're gonna get all those organized, uh, ready to go. Okay, so I'll just put these aside. And then I'm going to go into more detail about all the other ingredients that we use that are uh, generally involved in a niswa salad. Okay, so for example, we do have tomatoes, but we're using multicolored tomatoes. We do have <coughs> anchovies, 
that we've incorporated into uh, the vinaigrette. And then I have some beautiful white anchovies that we're going to lay across the top, okay? We have French beans, which again is more common now uh, when we talk about it, that I've pre-blanched just in boiling salted water and refreshed it in ice water so it halted the cooking. So different varieties of olives as well. So I, I did a Tujasca and a Niçoise. Niçoise is more typical for a Niçoise salad. Uh, and then the Tajasca is actually the same process of uh, the Niçois salad, which is cured in sea salt, uh, but it's an Italian variety of all, but very similar, okay? And then uh, some shallots, and what we've done, instead of adding them directly, we, are, we roasted them, so roasted them whole, just to give a little bit uh, difference and a different layer of flavor, as well as the eggs that we prepared in advance too, okay? So the eggs, we used a small quail egg that we just soft poached so that when we split it, hopefully this works, uh, it will uh, show some of the yolk and, and liquefy a little bit. So it'll be delicious, okay? So getting started up for the tuna, what we will organize first is we're gonna organize, and I, I did pre-make it, we're gonna organize some of the ingredients that we use for our blackening spice. So blackening spice, uh, or blackening seasoning, very popular in southern cuisine. Uh, it's going to add definitely a different layer of flavor to this dish, uh, rather than it just being the, the tuna itself. It's gonna give it a little bit of spice, but I acted on the Bagnos vinegar, which has a slight uh, anise flavor. So I did add a little bit of fresh anise in the blackening spice. So the ingredients that I used to incorporate these, so I used some fennel seed, I used some fennel seed and I toasted them. So I want to show you the difference between the two. So the ones that I toasted in the pan just to uh, accentuate and bring out some of the oil in the, the uh, fennel seed itself. And then I just grinded it up with a spice grinder or chop it by hand completely up to you. We used some white pepper. We used some ground black pepper. So some fresh black pepper. We used some garlic seasoning or garlic uh, salt. We also used uh, paprika. Uh, the blackening, you'll see that this blackening spice that I made is quite red. And uh, the reason it's red is because it has a very high uh, content of paprika. And the paprika actually, when it's searing in a very hot pan, it will burn on the exterior and it'll give a very strong aromatic uh, flavor to that tuna itself, okay? Because tuna has, I, I believe it has great flavor, but it does take from the other components in the dish to really make it overwhelming, okay? To make it fantastic. Uh, the two types of paprika I used, so I used a regular mild paprika, and I thought to add a little bit of smoked paprika in would really change things a little bit, okay? And again, going back to the French influence from Mr. Guy Demoiselle, we used an espalette pepper from France, okay? So again, another fantastic addition here. So the end result, everything was combined together, uh, the fennel seed was toasted and ground. Everything else was already ground, uh, and that was the end result, okay? So I'm gonna show you how to do that as soon as we start blackening the tuna itself. So I'm just gonna leave that here. I'll remove these ingredients. And now what we'll do is we'll start producing our Banyuls dressing. Okay. So our Banyos vinegar is a high-end uh, sweet wine vinegar from France. Uh, generally, uh, it is an oak-aged product, and usually it's aged for approximately five years. This particular Banyos uh, was aged for a year. I know I talked to you guys before about Pasquale Brothers in Etobicoke. I feel like a kid in a candy store every time I walk into this store. I walk in and I start with one concept in my mind of what I wanna do, and it turns me in 10 different directions just because there are so many great products in that store. Uh, they're so helpful, they've, they've always been fantastic. I've been dealing with them for years. I walked in and I picked up uh, smoked olive oil, uh, and they have Coslix mustard and they have all that wonderful stuff as well. But just to walk in as a chef, into a store like that and be able to take some of the ingredients that they have there and just turn it into something wonderful is really, really great. So if you guys do get a chance, 
uh, please check them out in, Eto in Etobicoke. They're right off Islington Avenue and they're doing store-to-door -door delivery now too with everything that's going on. Or you can go in, they have a retail uh, shop in the store as well that you can go in and shop, okay? So let's get going on the vinaigrette. Traditionally, again, back in the day, there was no uh, dressing on the Niçois salad. Originally, they just dressed it in good olive oil. Uh, but over the years, it's transformed and taken different direction from different chefs and different recipes. And I think it needs to see a little bit of the acidity on the vegetables just to help heighten the flavor, okay? So, simple recipe. I've given you the recipe on paper. A uh, little bit of Banyol's vinegar. So vinegar in the bowl first. Any questions, guys? Ask away. Dijon mustard. This will be the emulsifier in the dressing. Okay, so I'm going to put some Dijon mustard. You can use a grainy mustard. Completely up to you. I'm using just the simple President's Choice Dijon. Okay. Just going to get rid of these. Some honey. The organic honey if you have it, regular honey is fine as well. Uh, you can play around some different flavored honey, so like a buckwheat honey. But we're just putting a little bit of honey for the sweetness instead of sugar. Is that a little bit of honey, Evan? <laughs> Evan is so funny. He said every time that I say that I'm putting a little bit of something, I put a lot. So if I'm putting a little bit of salt, he watches me season and uh, I put a little bit more than a little. <laughs> so anchovy, I know you don't, uh, a lot of people don't enjoy the flavor of anchovy. The white anchovies are delicious. Uh, the amount of anchovy that's going in this dish is very little. Uh, so you're really not gonna feel it. You're gonna, you're gonna get it on the, on the edge of the dressing, but that's about it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mince this quite fine. And even on the side of my blade, I can just put it on my blade and turn it into a paste. But I, I don't want large pieces of anchovy. I just want to use it as a flavor builder. Uh, so I'm just going to mince it as fine as possible, okay? Okay, that should do it. And then we're going to whisk in some olive oil and some grapeseed oil. So grapeseed oil, typically I use a lot for flavored oils. It's one of the most neutral oils in the world, has very good health benefits as well. Uh, again, it's one of those oils that I don't think enough is known about, so not a lot of people do use it. Anchovy right in the bowl. Not a lot of people do use it, but uh, it is great for infused oils, uh, and it, it uh, has great health benefits, like I mentioned, okay? clean this up. We're going to do a little whisk of oil and the grapeseed oil. Okay, so grapeseed oil is right here. So you don't need a lot of oil. I want the acidity of this dressing. Just going to emulsify it a little bit. And just a little bit of the olive oil. And then I'm going to taste it. I'm going to season it up and I'm going to taste it, obviously. So let's get a little seasoning. Sam is very quiet today. Sam, what's your mom's background? I know you talked to me a little bit about pasta. Uh, is she Italian? What's your background? I, I like it a lot. I like very sharp dressings, and I do think it needs a little bit of sharpness. Okay? So, the dressing's finished. So, we're just going to put the dressing aside for a minute until we're ready to compose the salad. Okay? 
I'm just going to remove this plate. Clean up a little bit here. And then we're going to move on to the other side and we're going to start doing our tuna. Okay. So I'm just going to bring my ingredients over for the composed salad. So we talked about them a little bit. So I have my shallots already prepared and roasted. I have the quail eggs and like I said, a lot of them, uh, what I've done is, and you can feel them actually, that they're very soft, so that's ready to give. When quail eggs can be pretty tricky. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you the bottom and the top of the quail egg is where you're starting when you peel it, okay? Uh, I had a, a young apprentice in the kitchen years ago and she had such dainty small little fingers that she was ideal for this. A lot of people buy them in the can. You can get them in a lot of Asian markets, you can find them. Uh, Sam says he's from El Salvador, Central America. Central America. So your mom does cook a lot of pasta? Probably. Uh, so the, the, the egg itself, the top and bottom is where you want to start peeling okay so you're going to see that there's going to be a little opening in the top there and i can start peeling away and then what i like to do is i'll start on the bottom too right here just going to get an empty bowl the bottom too and i'll peel that right down okay so you'll see i'm starting to peel all the way down you have to be very gentle all the way down to where the top and uh, side meats and then I'll start peeling away on the sides okay like I said it doesn't help if you have sausage fingers like these but uh, if you have uh, if you take your time generally you'll end up with a really great product okay so see how the shell is coming off nicely and then the end result is for the most part it works all the time but you end up with a nice beautiful little quail egg that is soft centered Okay, so that's what we're looking for. To create that quail egg little trick, I'm just gonna leave it in this bowl for now so I don't cross contaminate. Uh, little trick is what I do with the quail eggs, uh, start them in cold water, turn the water to start simmering. As soon as it comes to a simmer, so when it's just starting to, to roll into a simmer, turn it off, let it sit for two minutes, take it off immediately in cold water, and generally you'll have a soft center. Uh, there are other methods you can use sous vide. I've never done it with sous vide. I've done it with large eggs, but I mean, when you're doing large volume, uh, sous vide is the easiest way in terms of making sure everything is uh, constant temperature, okay, and ideal temperature as it comes off, okay. So that's the quail eggs for us. He says his mom worked for Italians when he was younger. Oh, really? Eh? That's really cool because his mom is uh, amazing knowledge when we were talking about food and stuff like that. Sam's mom is quite uh, a chef. Okay, so here's, we're just getting everything ready to go. So again, we talked about French beans. Blanch them just in, in uh, really boiling, boiling salted water. Uh, take them out, refresh them in ice water right away. Uh, and the salt in the water is so important as well as the ice water. Um, to keep the green color and I want them to be crispy so even though they are cooked they still have nice crunch okay and they have good flavor because I salted them in a mess something about French beans everybody I remember the first time I had one of your friends clean a French bean and this on this end over here is where it would connect to the vine and on this end there's a little tip and <laughs> with French beans generally you want to leave that tip and not trim both sides, but I came back and they were chopping both sides of the French beans. Okay. Uh, we talked about some of the potatoes that I prepared in advance. So some of the potatoes I prepared in advance, I talked on the recipe about peeling the potatoes. So it really didn't make sense that I was peeling all of them because I did ask you to get some different colors. It's fine if you're going with one variety. So what I did is I peeled some of the fingerlings so I can pr prepare a different presentation for you. And then what I did is I blanched the other ones all in different shapes, so left some whole, cut some in cylinders, uh, cut some in larger pieces, and I'll show you why when we do that, okay? 
Uh, Sam asks, do you salt your ice bath? Uh, do I salt my... No, I don't salt the ice bath. Some people do. I, def I don't, though. Uh, some other additions to the Niçois salad over the years, and I brought them out, capers, have been uh, an addition over the years as well. And a great flavor component that I'm not adding today, but artichokes are fantastic, especially when they're in season, fresh artichokes. Okay, and that's all we need there. Uh, like I said to you, the quail eggs that we had here, I just bought at the Asian market, fresh quail eggs. Okay. So we'll bring our tuna back out of the fridge. I'm just going to take the tuna. I'm going to need some olive oil, and I'm going to need my blackening spice, okay? So I'm going to bring that over to the stove now. So what I'm going to start happening first is I'm going to start the, the temperature on the pan here. This is actually, I just bought these, these are, this is a crepe pan. Uh, and the reason I'm choosing to use this versus the regular frying pans is that it's very thin and it can get hot very quickly. Uh, skillet is ideal if you have a skillet at home, so a, a, a cast iron skillet. A very thin pan, so we use blue steel, sometimes French blue steel in the, in the restaurant as well. Uh, they're ideal. So that's the direction I would go if you had an opportunity. I'm just going to take the one piece of tuna that we decided we were going to sear. Right here. Got a question. What about deep fried capers? Amazing, especially for garnish. Great idea. Really, really great idea. Who is that from? Roman Empire Six. I believe that's Mr. Clement. Mikey, how are you, buddy? Uh, but yeah, it's a fantastic garnish. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the things. That's that's more of an old school garnish. I call it because that's probably what I was doing when I started off, but a lot of those uh, classic garnishes, I love to use. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did fried basil leaves, and I mean, I, I did that when I was apprenticing, but I still think they're very, they're very relevant, and they do add a lot to a dish, right? Okay, as long as the garnish or whatever you're adding to that particular dish makes sense, and uh, it adds to the flavor, it doesn't draw from the flavor, or it doesn't make things uh, confusing, I think that it's a, a good addition, definitely. My cap fried capers would be amazing. Okay, so we're going to get our tuna prepared here. So actually, what we're going to do here, and Billy's showing all the mess in the sink over here probably, uh, is I'm just going to season up uh, with the, the tuna. A lot of people dredge. Uh, I don't like to dredge because in this seasoning as well, it had uh, salt. So I don't want to add too much. And I, I don't want to do it too early. I mean, sometimes I've gone out for blackening and the, the, the seasoning on top of the tuna is so thick and so heavy that I can't even taste the fish anymore. So that's not what I'm looking for. I'm just going to season a little bit here and I'm getting my pan extremely hot, okay? Uh, in terms of the process itself, you can not season, sear the sides if you don't want to, completely up to you. I choose to, especially on a big, thick piece of tuna like this but uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, sear all the sides. Some people just sear the presentation side around here, okay? So I have some blackening spice to do some great steaks on the barbecue. Uh, this is more of a fish because of the addition of fennel, but it would still go fantastic with a ribeye steak or, or uh, with some chimichurri, depending on what I was using on a steak, uh, would be fantastic, okay? So what we're doing again is we're getting this pan really super hot. And I always say to the guys, put a dime of oil on there. What I mean is just a small amount like that, okay? You don't need a lot. Okay, with the amount of heat that's gonna be on this pan, it is not going to stick. Uh, one good piece of advice, especially if you're doing this at home, turn off your fire alarm, okay? Because it will create quite a bit of smoke, as you can see. And uh, if you do it out on the barbecue, fantastic. But I would turn off, we turn off the fire alarm just because, okay? So what I'm gonna do now, and you'll see right away, you can see the smoke coming off the pan, is I'm gonna start the sear, okay? What I'm looking for is that tuna, I want it to still be rare on the inside, and I'm looking for a thin line of sear and blackening of the spice. It doesn't need to be, uh, 
completely really, really dark black. Uh, in fact, that probably adds a little bit of bitterness, which I'm fine with too, as long as the complexity of the salad makes sense. But uh, for what I want here is I just want to build the aromatics of those seasonings that are on the outside of the fish and just accentuate them and help, help the flavor of the fish here. Again, there was salt in this uh, dry rub, so I'm not going to salt the fish until the very end. I'm going to put a little bit of uh, adjusting salt at the very end just to help it, okay? So see the color there? That's exactly what I'm looking for, okay? Just a nice thin line and, and some blackening of those spices. And I'm gonna allow this to rest. Now this composed salad is uh, room temperature. So all the ingredients are gonna be room temperature. I'm gonna allow the tuna to rest and then I'll slice it and put it on top of the salad, okay? Any other questions? Mikey, good to see you, buddy. Mike Thank you says, for joining us. Mike says, God, I love your stove. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't love it. Next week we gotta get it fixed. The oven doesn't work. I haven't cooked this much on this stove ever. Okay, so again, some nice blackening seasoning there. So we're getting a nice black color on the exterior. I don't need to go any more than that. I'm really just trying to build flavor on this tuna. Another thin line. This is probably gonna be our last live. I might do them every once in a while again. Uh, but we're back at the club. I'm so happy to be back with my team and we're doing a lot of great things there So we will do other videos, but probably this will be the last live, okay? But please keep sending me uh, requests and what you want to see again This was a request from mr. Guillaume Danozel. Hopefully he can watch it. I know he's back to work now, too He's a chef at a restaurant out in Hamilton right now, and they just started up curbside and stuff like that as well, okay? Be all coming from the breakfast side. Mike is a fantastic young chef that's been at the Boulevard Club for a number of years and without him I couldn't do what I do for sure. Any of my team. Great article I sent you guys about the dishwashers, eh? <laughs> so we'll go back to the other side now. I'm going to bring that tuna over in a second and I'm just going to start composing my dish, okay? So we talked a little bit about the ingredients. Uh, I have a bowl here that I'm just gonna start composing the dish. I have a cutting board ready to slice my tuna. I'm just gonna put some gloves on again and uh, get ready for the, the mixing of the salad. You can use tongs if you'd like. I just feel more comfortable with the plating of this dish using some uh, latex, non-latex gloves. Okay, so what we're gonna do with this dish I'm going to take a couple of smaller pieces of caramelized shallots. So just like that. And the only th what I did to do that is just saute them in the pan. Little olive oil, salt and pepper, medium to low heat, uh, gradually caramelizing them and sauteing them. They developed a lot of sugar and a lot of flavor. Like you can see that, they look fantastic. Uh, so that's going to be an addition here. I'm going to pick a few pieces of potato and really there's no rhyme or reason here. I'm just picking the ones that I think will present well. So I definitely want a Peruvian, and maybe I'll cut that one in half, I think. A couple of the fingerlings, a couple of the Klondike Rose. A cylinder of a peeled fingerling. Maybe a piece here, okay? So this is all going in the bowl now. I'm gonna grab some of those beautiful mixture of olives, okay? And they actually, the Tajaska came in the olive oil, so I retained that olive oil, and it actually is fantastic just for inside the bowl here. Okay, some tomatoes, and I did say cut them in half if they're large, but I have some gorgeous tomatoes that are small enough that they can be incorporated into a salad bowl, or cut in half if they're larger, so I can do that as well. And that's all, all ready to go now too. Uh, I'm not going to do any of the artichoke and capers. I did mention that's a possibility, but definitely it's not something I want to do right now. And I'm going to bring back my dressing, okay? So that uh, the other thing we're going to add in here is a little bit of fresh herb. So herb in the dressing is something that is, is very common as well. So that's just a little bit of chopped chives. A little bit of, of uh, dill very small dill fronds. Okay, so just the, the leaves, the outer leaves of the dill. Okay. 
okay? And just some dressing. Okay, so let me grab my dressing. So again, dressing we prepared in advance. For this amount, I'm probably going to do about a tablespoon and a half. That's all I need. Some uh, salt and pepper. A little bit of cracked pepper. And then the rest of the ingredients, and you'll see some of my additions after, are going to be final garnishes, okay? So let me just get this out of the way for everybody so that you can see. Oh, sorry, and my French green beans. Almost forgot. So three, four pieces French green beans. And I'll bring my plate over so we're ready to go. So the decision for the plate today, we talked about it being more of a main course. So definitely, I wanted a plate that would support that. So I'm just going to wipe my plate. Probably all my fingers are showing on the plate now too. And using my spoon, I'm just going to mix all that dressing through that wonderful salad. Okay. And now I'm going to start plating. And I want to scatter this across the plate, okay? So I'm going to pick one area. I'm probably going to cut this potato, just making sure it has a flat base. Delicious. Just so I can stand it up. And I'm just bringing those colors across the plate, okay? Some of those beautiful shallots. A salad of this style could sell anywhere from $21 to $24, depending on how much tuna we gave, obviously. I don't think that's that much, given the quality of the tuna and stuff like that that we're putting on here. The one thing I really wanted to get out of these videos by doing them at home is to show everybody that it's really all about ingredients, okay? So yes, I've been doing this for a long time. But the complexity of this dish, even though there's a lot going on, anybody could do at home. Anybody. And I mean that. It really is something that looks harder than it is. It's just about knowing and understanding proper techniques and using those proper techniques to create a great dish. Okay, so I'm going to put that aside. The quail eggs. And again, if you wanted to bring them to the next level, you could take the, any of these quail eggs and you could... Uh, pickle them, you could uh, just uh, salt cure them, you could do a number of different things with them, okay? I'm not going to cut it only because uh, it's soft centered, and I'll show you one before we, we close just to see what it looks like, okay? And I'm just going to go get our tuna so that we can finish this dish. Okay, I'm going to bring some of the finishing concepts that I thought would be fantastic with this. So all those beautiful elements on that salad. This dish is looking fantastic. I have a little bit of a, a seasoning salt. Mustard is a must. I brought in some different uh, white balsamic vinegar pearls. We made a herb oil this morning, so there's a lot going on in this plate. Now I'm bringing it from a simple presentation, which I think looks great as it is, to the next level where it would be adding those elements to make it die here, okay? So I'm just going to cut in my tuna, and you'll see very sharp knife. I think it's seared pretty well. I'm hoping my dream team thinks the same, okay? I'm going to go with three pieces for this dish because I don't want to ruin the presentation either. I'm going to scatter the tuna in three different placements. It's always better, and I don't know uh, where you've been taught or, or uh, from what your chef's perspective is, but it's always better uh, from a visual appeal 
to use uh, off numbers, so uh, not using uh, two slices of tuna, I'm better off using three. From an eye standpoint, it just presents nicer, okay? Now I'm gonna put some of the different elements. This is bringing it to the next level. So a little bit of Coslix mustard, which is a uh, mustard company in Ontario. This is called their Triple Crunch. Some of that beautiful smoked olive oil, just a little bit. It's really gonna punch the flavor of the smoked paprika. Little bit of finishing salt, just on my tuna. Those white balsamic pearls, which I think are gonna add that element of wow factor from a guest point of view, where they, they get a punch of acidity and it really changes things up a little bit. So there's some beautiful pearls. I don't know if you can see those. And these, again, I was just walking in. The Squally Brothers, I've made them before, but they had them, so I said, fantastic. Okay, some of that beautiful herb oil, and this is a dill and parsley oil, just to get a little punch of color on the plate as well. Okay, and then last but not least, some baby arugula from Sleater's Farm. And I'm just gonna place that in some different areas, just giving that. This is actually a very, very popular salad since uh, uh, 2000s have, has been on a lot of menus. Uh, actually, Ramsey said that it was uh, one of the best complex summer salads of the 20th century or something like that, he said. But uh, Ramsey, there are a couple other big celebrity chefs that absolutely love new swaths, okay? So I just want to show you the final dish. So we have seared tuna niçoise with uh, some quail eggs done in a contemporary style, uh, some different potatoes, banyos vinaigrette. Uh, we have some Coslix mustard, some herb oil. Uh, thank you guys so much. I want to tell everybody, I really appreciated the support and coming out and seeing me on these live ventures. I think that we've done a wonderful job in connecting and staying busy during this crazy COVID uh, pandemic. And I thank everybody, please stay uh, on our, and subscribe on our YouTube channel for some other great recipes. We're gonna continue going with that. But God bless everybody. Thank goodness it's all over and we're back to work. And I hope you enjoy this tuna niçoise uh, for dinner tonight or tomorrow night, okay? Thank you.